On this edition of Thinking Biblically, Dr. Todd Anderson, principal of Augustine College, joins me to discuss how to navigate our ever-increasingly digital world and what it's doing to us. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. My name is Alan Gilman. Thinking Biblically is a podcast dedicated to exploring how all of Scripture speaks to all of life. Before I introduce our guest, um, I want to remind everyone to please remember to subscribe if you haven't done so already, to also to review and to share, and at the end I'll give out uh, my email address if you want to send anything to me directly. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Todd Anderson. Todd Anderson is principal of Augustine College, a classical Christian post-secondary institution here in, here in, I'm in Ottawa, but he's, the school's in downtown Ottawa. He has a PhD in English from Carleton University, also here in Ottawa, where he explored the Anglo-Latin poetry of George Herbert, which is not what we're going to be talking about today, I don't think. Todd also serves on the board of elders at Calvary Baptist Church. Again, surprise, in Ottawa. He's married to Heather, and they have six children. Todd Anderson, welcome to Thinking Biblically. Thank you very much, Alan, for the introduction. Nice to be here with you. Yeah, so we met uh, about a month ago or so, and we talked about a lot of things. We were actually kind of uh, table booth buddies at a homeschool conference uh, not far from, from where I live. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we hit it off. <laughs> And you agreed to come on the podcast. And so what we're going to discuss, we're going to try to discuss, I'm calling it navigating a digital world. And I decided not to use the digital world as a way to express that. Um, I think there's still the option of disconnecting from it all. And so I imagine there are people who are somewhat successful at not navigating a digital world. Uh, obviously, right now we are, um, and so I did want to start with, um, can you share a little bit your own relationship to the technology? So we're going to talk about the theory, but in terms of your practice, obviously, um, or maybe I should just stop right now and, and, you know, and just erase it all and stop doing the podcast. Maybe I will by the time we get to the end of the, of our conversation, but where are you at personally with the technology? Do you remember, do you remember the first time you used a computer, the first time you held a smartphone in your hand? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I actually grew up in Bancroft, Ontario, before my parents and I moved to Peterborough. And my dad, bus driver, mom's a nurse. So we were up in the boonies, essentially. They sort of built their dream home. And this was before the age of the internet. So I recall very vividly when we got sort of first technology. And I, I bring up the, the past because when you live in the boonies, you're sort of a couple of years behind technologically where everything else in the major cities has gone. And so I have a vivid memory of first impressions of what technology might be doing to me as a person. Of course, when I was a kid, I didn't think that way. You just got excited about, I don't know, what is it? The older 3DOs or the, you know, the Tandy 1000 computers. We used to have floppy disks. So I'm sort of right on the edge of when that technological shift move forward. And so my relationship to tech has always been quite strong in the sense that my dad was interested in it and my brothers were interested in it. So growing up, it was our, always sort of a part of our life. But of course, we're talking about old tech, like, you know, four, 480s and stuff that was really slow and, and having the internet plugged into your your phone so that if you're on the internet, somebody couldn't be on a, a home phone call. So that is really largely my upbringing. Today, my wife and I, with six kids, we have laptops in the house we have things like ipads we have cell phones and smartphones and so we do interact with this world though our process has been to try to think through a little more carefully than some of the folks around us that we see and what i mean by that largely and i'm sure this will be part of what we talk about today is the difference between technology in a public space and the private technology of the smartphone and how it reshapes the way somebody thinks about their own interactions so at home we have things like computers and phones, but we sort of share them, generally speaking. And it was only until like, we moved a few years ago to Canada. We were in uh, Southwood Drive in Ottawa near the IKEA. We had a home phone there. We still had one. 
And that was our basic, uh, you know, communication and we loved it. And then it became too expensive once we moved to Canada. I'm not sure what Bell charges now, but it was something in the $120 range to just have a home phone, whereas that used to be the primary piece of communication. So in terms of tech, I use it every day. Our kids use it frequently for their home education to some degree, uh, but we make sure that it's sort of a more public and accessible piece. But that's just an overview. of. I hope that helps to clarify. What are the ages of your kids? So my eldest is 15 and then all the way down to one year. Okay, just to get an idea um, mm -hmm. uh, where that would be and how that would relate to all the all the technology and, and all the rest. Absolutely. So Yeah, so um, uh, Todd sent me some notes of this presentation that he recently did at the homeschool convention where we're at together. I wasn't able to attend the session, but he sent me, sent me his notes. And there was a quote there uh, by Sean Parker, who was the first president of Facebook. And it was from an interview that he did for the American news website Axios back in 2017. And as I checked it out, it seems to me that it's still as pertinent today as it was uh, six years ago. So I also... Uh, managed to find the video. Thank you, technology. Find the video of that segment that was that um, Todd quoted, and it includes the quote. And there's it starts off a little bit more, but not too much more. And so I thought we'd watch it and then get your um, your reaction to it. When Facebook was getting going, I had these people who would come up to me, um, and they would say, you know, I'm not on social media. And I would say, okay, <laughs> you know, you will be. And then they would say, they would say, no, 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 no. I value my real life interactions. I value the moment. I value presence and I value intimacy. And I would say, well, you're a conscientious objector. That's okay. You don't have to participate, but you know, we'll get you eventually. <clears throat> and, and, and like, I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying, <laughs> because it the un, the unintended consequences of 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 a of a network when it grows to a billion or two billion people, and it and it begin and it it literally changes your relationship with society, with each other, with you know it 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 probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. It. God only knows what it's doing to to our children's brains. You know, if the if the thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it, that thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. I and mean, it's a, it's a val it's a social validation feedback loop that, that it's like a, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. And I just, I, th I think that we, you know, we, the inventors, creators, you know, and it's, it's me, it's Mark, it's the, you know, Kevin Systrom at Instagram, it's all of these people, um, understood this consciously, and we did it anyway. Pretty wild. Yeah, there's a, I've actually watched this several times now, and there is so much uh, in, in what he's saying. Uh, mm -hmm. The social validation feedback loop Absolutely. But anyway, whether focus on that or whatever you want to pick apart with with that. Um, sure. Yeah. The thing I'd like to start with is his admission, really, that they both didn't really know what they were doing. And they sort of became aware of the implications and did it anyways, that, that we have a morality, as it were, now tied into the production of these technologies. And I, I don't say that lately. I'm not saying, for example, that Facebook is evil or Instagram. What I'm remarking on is that there are moral questions that were asked and answered at the level of production before they began this process. And that's really important for Christians to understand 
And it's a way for us to talk to the broader culture and even to our own people and say, hey, look, moral questions enter in at all of the earliest stages of these developments. What does that mean for us? You know, so I, I think it's very fascinating that he signals that. Yeah, one of, I, perhaps one of the things going on is I don't know if they are in their boardrooms plotting and planning evil as much as we have a compelling product. We can reach a lot of people and make a lot of money and then not really consider what the the morality is or what the effects are or even you know what it's doing to children's brains mm -hmm. and and that we didn't really come on to to discuss moral responsibility in the business world uh but certainly right. that's somewhere central to all this yeah absolutely and look i don't want to frame these as evil guys but the truth is they're the ones signaling it that in this boardroom setting, whatever they were doing, they were asking moral questions. And I think it's really important to start there instead of beginning often where we do with technology, which is to say, well, it's just a tool and it's neutral. And I, I think largely there is so much usefulness in tech, but it's a fallacy to start in that position. So that's kind of the first thing that that comes out to my mind. Yeah, I've I've spent quite a bit of time trying to think about, is it really true that science and technology is neutral in and of itself? Hmm. Even if that's possible, it's still in the context of human behavior. And so there's a necessary moral component. You know, the dynamite doesn't just sit there objectively by itself as a thing. It, hmm. it, it's created in relationship to human beings and therefore it's going to have moral ramifications because human beings are involved. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, you have this problem he's, de he's developing in that conversation about, well, another part, I, I think before I get to that is this audience, you know, what's the nature of this audience he's at now? I don't have the whole context, but in a way he's retelling a story about the development of tech. And so there's already this sense in my mind of the way we curate or tell a story about the development of our, our behavior shaping technologies. This is hopefully an audience that's interested in tech. They're interested in development. They're maybe making apps. I'm not sure what they're doing, but he's brought there as a guest. And it's just a fascinating look at our culture, the way that we valorize tech development, the way that if you say you're in tech, you know, especially, you know, Waterloo in Canada, you think about the development of BlackBerry, you think about the explosion of tech in that genre. It's it's all the rage. What do you want to do? I want to be a software developer. I want to do these things. Part of the economy of that includes having these people come and share their experience. And in some ways, he's talking about what we might think of as a damning moment in the life of tech, that we were taking advantage of the behavior of children and people, and we didn't have a concept for how it would explode. And yet at the same time, this conference that he's at shows us that we still really want to be part of it, you know, as a human culture. And I, that's just another sort of interesting note. Um, I don't know if this is your, your field or how much you've thought about this, but do you think the technology has changed children's brains? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, we do talk about plasticity now in that field, and that is to say that the brain is a bit more malleable than we used to think of it. So the story we're telling about the development of the brain includes rewiring and almost really funny technological metaphors, right, to talk about the computerized brain and how it shifts and changes. So I, I don't think it's really valuable from my perspective to say definitively, yes, it changes their brains. I don't actually believe that. I think the, the brain seems to be able to go back and forth. So if you've spent a lot of time with computers and tech, you you will develop habits that will shape your brain, but it's not the sort of thing that can't be undone. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of my position on it. Another way of thinking of it is if you're in the water, you'll be soaked and wet and you'll take up and absorb a certain amount of water, but you can leave the pool and dry off. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist though. So right, in right. terms of the metaphors we tell about 
people's brains and their experience, the practical evidence is yes, it does. It really well, okay. does shape and change habits. Well, that would be good news if we come to the conclusion that we need to pull back from or disconnect from it. But it isn't necessarily good news if we stay in the water of the digitized world. Sure. And and this is one of those questions is, can we ever really pull back now? And again, I don't want to be doom and gloom. I'm actually not sure if the solution is to disconnect. Um, we've we've given over to the tech world so much of ourselves, and we'll get into this conversation, I'm sure, as we go forward. But um, is pulling out a, a good idea, like a Mennonite, for example, we were signaling before, there's whole cultures that have decided this is the way to go. We're going to stop at 1847 and ev all technological developments after that we won't consider valid or whatever you want to say. Um, it just creates a sort of puritanical culture. And there are other problems with that way of as Christians, how do we win the world? How do we evangelize? How do we uh, share the gospel? How do we share the truth of Christ if there's no connection to the world of tech? Um, you know, Okay. have you have you. How have you picked up on the effects of more and more emerging technology and how ubiquitous it's become uh, in, in recent years with the students that you're interacting with? Yeah, that's a great question. So some of the practical signals that we often see is the capacity for students to do uh, tasks, academic tasks, that, that were almost a given 50 years ago. So this means things like writing, the capacity to develop an argument that is cohesive, and the quality of diction and syntax within those um, demonstrations, the capacity to speak at length without mumbling or stuttering or being distracted, the capacity to take in information, to memorize. These pieces we see in um, pedagogical settings where there is an older model in place, like a classical model of training, that those students exhibit remarkably proficiency in areas that are typically pedagogical over the last thousand years. But in the university settings, the social behaviors of the students when they come up to talk to a prof after a class, their body language, their behaviors, their diction, all of these are, are marked by the technology that they use. Even, uh, you know, think about the smartphone in that context. How do they contact their profs? How do they want to submit their documentation? How do they want to do their examinations? COVID showed us in the academic setting a whole new range of approaches. We're going to do online learning. We're going to do online examination. What does that do for the quality of an education? If you are at your desk or at your laptop in your bed, typing your exam at 11 p.m., you really have access to all kinds of material. What can we test for as uh, an academic institution because they're enabled to access Google. What can we, you know, how does that transform how we think about the whole project? So things like oral examination, things like writing quality have significantly dropped, not just at university, but right down through to public systems. And all of it largely has to do with the changes in the digital landscape and how it shapes the kids' behavior. Um, and, you know, we, we get these anecdotes from public school teachers as well. Like we have family who teach in the public system, grade six and under, you still see the same kinds of features about their ability to participate, the capacity for a child to pay attention at their desk, and then the alarming number of uh, maybe psychological issues that are present or prevalent in those public systems. All of these to me are markers of a whole culture-wide shift in this respect. It might uh, be obvious for the people watching and listening why their behaviors are like that, but could you pinpoint what it is about the technology that is crippling young people and now older young people's ability to communicate and engage some of the things that you shared? Um, how did, we, yeah, so how does the technology, how has it done this? To yeah, it's a, another great question. Um, if you think about the clip we just watched, one of the things that was marked about his statements is this focus on attention. The focus on the dopamine, really a kind of scientific or medical way of talking about these issues, but it's all wrapped up in the same metaphor of how the mind is engaged 
Is it engaged actively and consciously? That's the sort of phrases he was using. We want to dominate that arena so that whatever you're paying attention to is funneled through us. That way we're getting your eyes and ears. And this is an advertising that's gone back many years. We know how this works. You put a huge billboard um, on the side of the road, you're going to attract eyes as people are driving along. But now imagine a world in which you have in your pocket that attention at all stages. And they don't just do it on the visual side. They do it on the auditory side. So what do we hear when we wake up? Little pings or noises. You know, we used to have nice ringtones for phones that would tell you, go and get the phone. But now you have a whole host of um, sensorium for, we don't have smells yet, but if they could figure out a way to make a smartphone give off odors, I guarantee you someone would produce that app because it's the same signals that are being sent. So over time... You better, you better you patent that. that. Should well, we pause right, and you can go can. patent it? Okay, go on. <laughs> yeah, we'll just stop the podcast and we'll go and finish that and then come back. But no, but right, the, this problem of how do I capture attention? And what happens if you manage to do that? That is to say, you can create the habit in a young person of going to Instagram over and over again. And why might they go there? Well, social validation. That's where all my peer groups are. So when you think about where people used to be 50 years ago in a high school, they were hanging out in the hallways. They were playing sports. They were at a band practice. They, If you're thinking about the older generation, they were at a bar, hanging out with their buddies, watching a game. They were playing a sport. There's physical spaces. When the digital age sort of wraps us all in its envelope, as someone like McLuhan might say, you suddenly are everywhere at once. And where are the young people? Well, they are essentially on texts with each other constantly throughout the day. They are on Instagram and TikTok, scrolling through videos. That produces an interaction in the mind, in the brain, where you're getting, as he said, those dopamine hits of interaction. You're getting likes. You're getting valor you know, validation in those modes. So that's that's the basic feature of how all social media works. It's really the amplification of advertising at the personal level across all interactions and it sort of has a fascinating effect yeah, it, interesting that there are a lot of young people that are still involved in sports and they're in the theater group and they go to parties and and they they, they I don't know if movies count. We'll leave that alone for now. Uh, but it, is, it tends to be a group activity when young people are doing it and all that sort of thing. Uh, but it's almost as if the climax to those experiences today is what you share on social media and then how people respond to that. Um, I was recently, my wife and I was visiting one of our kids in Texas. And um, there's a part of me when I take a walk, I would love to have my phone out all the time taking pictures. And I, 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 I try not to because I, I want to experience the experience not through the lens. That's something I developed going way back. We had a video camera and we'd go to kids events and there was the expectation we've got to film this. And, and the original video cameras had little black and white viewfinders. And I wasn't connecting with the recital with with whatever it, it might have been and whether it it became i set up the camera in such a way so i could instead of watching through the viewfinder i would watch it directly so it's something that i've been trying to do having said that i took a butterfly picture and if you're on my facebook you're one of my facebook friends you saw my butterfly picture it is like it's a national geographic photo yeah, this yeah. close-up oh my god of this beautiful butterfly and there's you know my anything else that i experience in nature that's my private experience but boy to be able to share the butterfly photo and get responses i might have got two or three but still you know it talk about dopamine so so 100%. it's it's interesting that even the personal experiences that we're having now um climax with the sharing on social media and without it you know that it's hardly it's not even the icing on the cake there's something more to it and, you know, that, again that social validation that comes yeah and, and i agree with you that it's the climax but it also happens to be often the the reason why we go to these things in the first place and i don't go mean to the sporting you, event go to the sporting event or participate in, with your friends somewhere oh, that, so that we have say, have the thing to share that's right. Okay. That in some, some, and this isn't all realms, but for some people, it is such a draw 
and this is where influencers come from, by the way, you know, that whole spectrum of people who feel like it is a job to essentially go around filming themselves in various places. Why has, is this such a trend in our society? Because before the event has even occurred, it's already mediated through a cell phone experience, essentially, or through what this enables us to do to share it broadly, to get commentary, to develop um, some kind of community around it. And so it's this strange experience of being both the climax of I had the most amazing time and look at I'm with my friends and it was a blast. So that's a capstone experience. But it's also for some people, the reason why they went there in the first place. And that's a fascinating feature that it can be both, but it has to do with how our habit makes us feel as if I'm naked unless I'm here with my device, that this experience is a downer unless I can capture it, that I haven't really done something unless I can record it and share it with others. So let's go back to the what you perceive to be a, a difficulty, an inability of young people to interact uh, with professors and, and formulate sentences and all the rest. Do you want to talk about how... Um, how the media has has helped bring this about sure how how well, how has it crippled people now of course they don't think they're crippled sorry folks but go for it yeah i think to myself one avenue to think about it is the nature of language and how it changes now all languages are always developing they're they're alive meaning we create new words we create new ideas but if you have an entire world that is now accessible across every space. I can talk to you, we're in the same city. I could talk to somebody across the planet and we can have a shared experience. What happens to the nature of language over time? Say English in this case, which is essentially the universal language of the planet at this moment, maybe Chinese will take over or Mandarin will take over another stage, we're not sure. But the point is it changes how people interact. It creates smaller micro communities that develop in their own ways and it develops also a movement away from uh, language that is of a fixed kind we can now use emojis we now you know tweet and text and that develops its own style its own linguistic register tweeting this idea of you know removing uh, or sorry excuse me creating a boundary only this many words that's the only thing you can do in tw in twitter you can't go beyond a certain number of uh, letters all of these pieces the the development of the blog do you remember we used to blog and now we don't really do that anymore because technology has developed and we we video log but this entire sensorium of our experience really reshapes the the nature of education itself because a, a kid gets into a subculture this is the way they talk. It, it's the same for before technology took over, but it just gives it a new complexion. Can you speak to the subculture of this teenager? What about the words and diction of this uh, group of youth? How does it change? How does it develop? And one thing we see is over time, these technologies really amplify short types of communication, like texts and tweets, and uh, direct communication and exaggeration. And the last one is really important. What I mean by that is in order for you to be heard above the noise in a given communicative moment, say on, on Twitter, what do you have to do? Say somebody puts a hilarious video on or something really shocking the, in politics. If you want to comment on it and people feel compelled to do so, how do you get the most likes? This is really, now people don't think consciously about it, but this is really what's running underneath. Well, you have to say something that's witty. You have to say something that's going to grab attention, right? And so it develops it on the linguistic register, this approach to language, which is brief, concise, and punchy, or in, in a word, it exaggerates to make it look like it's important. Think about, and maybe you do this for your YouTube videos, I'm not sure, but think about the way that we uh, title our YouTube videos. What do you respond to? Think about the images that you put on as the thumbnail for your YouTube videos. What do people respond to? It's fascinating to look at what the next generation is doing. More or less, if you don't put a video that says, Todd Anderson destroys technology, you know, you're not going to get the kind of interaction you're looking for. If you say a really interesting talk with my friend Todd about technology, 
you you you're laughing and you agree with like you see the way in which exaggeration has transformed the landscape for us that's that's really just one way that the youth have are shaped by this phenomenon is the linguistic register so are you saying i should look for and, it's, and i'm serious because i actually been thinking about this i realized recently because i love doing my thumb uh, i love doing my thumbnails there's i don't know there's that uh it's yeah, who go. am I doing this for, really? But I, I I've been doing blogs, I uh, commenting on the books of Moses. I've been doing that for over twenty five years. It's called Torah Bites, and I love doing the title. After, often I'll write the, the thing. It's about a page long. And how do I come up with a good title? But to be fair, to be fair, to be truthful, and fair, um, I'm trying to come up with a good summary title. I'm not coming up with. Uh, I did one this week called. Um, what did I call it? It's a sacrifice of a different kind, and I used uh, a close encounters kind of font on on the on the image that I created. I, so I try to do something that's engaging, that's kind of fun, that will get mm -hmm. people's attention. In other words, not boring, uh, but mm -hmm. I also want it to be meaningful. And what I don't want to do, though, is the, you know, obviously you're not trying to destroy technology. I'm not going to call it that. Um, and I also, I, I'm really, can I say, I'm, I, boy, I don't like clickbait. I think it's terrible. You know, you know renowned sports uh, news uh, agencies, you know, you can ask me which one, people can ask me later, but there's one in particular that keeps coming up in my, my Android news feed. And mm -hmm. it's so clicky baity where it tells me something that I kind of am interested in and I have to go paragraph after paragraph after paragraph to find out what in the world is actually talking about. And I think yeah. that's, I really think that's cheap. Like it's one thing to do something that's inviting and, and grabby, if that's a word, um, but to basically lead your audience on a path. And I know why it's done because the further you go down, you're going to see more ads, the more you're on the site. That's the reason. But it's it's now become detached, I believe, from actually serving the, the people you're serving, except for the advertisers. So if you're only serving the advertisers, thinking you'll keep the people anyway, who cares? You know, just let them scroll, scroll, scroll. They're going to do it. Um, what, what I want to come to is um so be, you were talking about you started that last section about language and the development of language which is a very fascinating and important topic um and as followers of the lord we want to be concerned that we are talking language that people understand you know the mm -hmm. whole controversy hundreds of years ago about translating the bible into the local vernacular and is that redundant um but in language that the local people could understand and, and other the purists didn't like that and they wanted to keep control and, and thankfully uh well it won the day that we can have the bible in english and, and so on and we want to use an english that people are going to understand probably something not quite like george herbert's poems but um we want to communicate in languages that people understand but is there a limit to that so i'm picturing um the the culture has been affected by TikTok and and twitter and, and 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 facebook and so on um and communication 140 characters and flashy photos and 15 second videos and this sort of thing does that mean we have to do that to communicate to the generation of people who've been affected by it or is there a limit where we go, you know what? 15 second videos is a way to communicate truth may not be healthy for people. Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the things that's gonna be difficult for us as Christians is to figure out how do we still interact with people if they are so consumed in this culture of the 15 second video? Like someone who's really sp spends their day licking on their phone. How do you meet with that person if they aren't, say, at your church or your midweek group or if they're not part of your yoga club or whatever you're going to? And so in some respects, no intervention of language on our part to be careful about language will really impact that that divide if we're never with the people. But part of what I was pointing to with the linguistic register 
is that there is a kind of weakness in it or an ossification of language, like bones that become brittle when you become old. I don't really know. I'm, I'm a young man, so I'm, I'm on my way, but, uh, but my betters will know. Um, you know, it's harder. It's harder in your joints. It's harder in your body. But language has the same feature. If you overuse a word, remember the word amazing? We used to know what that meant. It, it used to give us a sense of awe. There are many, many words like that that are exaggerated or overused. And swearing actually is is the same thing now. So if you look at the register of offensive language, all of the swear words that were such a taboo to us 25 years ago are now like adjectives and adverbs in the mouth of the next generation. And, you know, we might be shocked and like, oh, that's a massive moral issue. Well, sort of. But it's also this sense of the way that language itself changes and grows and really weakens over time if people fill up their vocabulary with these words just to describe ordinary events. Like I went down and got some milk for one person might be a slew of expletives just to explain that one event. What does that do for that person long term in their life? And how do we as Christians respond to it? Well, you can just take out the expletives and talk to them as a normal human being. Maybe it seems boring in the event. It'll certainly make for a shorter statement. I went to get milk at the store. But it also gives us leverage to speak to people who are chained up by a, you know, a consistent pressure to use language in this way. To say the word really four times to get your point across instead of just explaining it with a different adjective. And look, I'm not saying that lang language use of this is a magic bullet or something for the way that we Christians... Uh, deal with people. But what I'm saying is actually, if we're just normal people, if our diction is of a normal kind, and we don't look to shock everybody with our language and go over the top just to get across a certain point, we'll find over time that we have a lot to say to people, and they may not have a, a way to respond to that. So the the person who puts a YouTube out, if your language is filled with really rich content, you think about people like Jordan Peterson and the way he's developed and how people have flocked to that. A lot of that's just a linguistic response. I mean that sincerely, that young guys sit in the audience and they listen to him speak. And what does he not do? Stumble, mutter, like there's a little bit of it. But the consistency of his d discourse across two or three hours is remarkable. And it's not just uh, filler words or fluff. It's legitimate, powerful statements and ideas. In a way, uh, as Christians, Scripture is filled with, if it fills our minds, it fills us with an opportunity to speak so much good into people, and we don't have to stray too far from, from Scripture. Well, using the Jordan Peterson uh, example uh, and his two- to three-hour lectures that apparently are majority attended by young men, mm -hmm. um, says to me, that we don't have to cater to uh, a weak, non-descriptive, often actually meaningless language. It, from what I've seen, uh, is among many people, mainly young people, but that age is getting older and older because apparently mm -hmm. everybody gets older. Uh, language has become more emotive than meaningful. So and it's not like it's not expressing of ideas; it's simply expressing feeling. Sure. But we're more complicated than that as human beings, and you know I've seen it uh, with my own kids, and I teach at St. Timothy's Classical Academy, and I'm sure you're seeing it where you are at Augustine College. That if you give human beings the opportunity to engage meaning and depth. That because we're made in God's image, it can be done. Well, it's, that's like taking them out of the water, the earlier illustration you use, which again, because my a lot of people would think um, that we're supposed to meet people where they're at. Well, that's true, but are we supposed to leave people where they're at? And so if they're stuck in the, in the TikTok universe, uh, there could be an argument to try to reach them through TikTok. Even Jordan Peterson has TikTok videos. Somebody's doing it for him, I'm sure, taking a little. Mm -hmm. But the idea is so that they would engage the long form uh, discussions, conversations, and lectures, not just leave them in 15, you know, the universe of 15 second videos. 
Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and this is really the goal on the Christian side as far as reaching people. Is you want a personal relationship, like really meaningfully. You want a person to treat you as a person in real time. And we used to be able to do that competently. But now the, the young people are, in my mind, struggling to figure out how do I engage socially we talk about socialization and often within the homeschooling context you get a lot of flack because people feel oh your child's not socialized but the truth is that the system at the moment the public system is not really developing past these digital barriers that are encouraging people to have a habit of mind which does not enable the sort of rich experience of life that a relationship provides and so frankly just being a human being Asking questions, listening to them is often far above the regular intake of relationship that most people experience, which is, you know, phenomenal. So I want to look at um, how the technology changes our lives and changes life. And I want to go back. You already mentioned him, uh, but there's the famous quote from Malcolm Muggridge uh, from his uh, uh, 1964 book. Understanding media, which I have oh, Marshall McLuhan. Did I do that Mother again? Yeah. Do you know how many times I do that? I'm not going to change this, folks. I'm going to leave it in because for some reason I'm always calling Marshall McLuhan Malcolm Mugridge. They <laughs> it's were right they were here friends. in my notes. <laughs> but in my my I I have uh where is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually copied an email that she sent me yesterday, and it says Marshall McLuhan. Oh, you have it there. Yeah, I have a copy. Excellent. Well, I borrowed it from the library. And I don't Good. know if you remember what it what it says. It's either in the foreword of the introduction about how the editor s said to him that it, a, a book is normally supposed to have three or four or five new ideas. And he had like 36. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm reading and I, I know what these words are. <laughs> but yeah. boy, that was one book that was difficult to understand. <laughs> Absolutely. And you sent me a quote, and I like the way he says here something. He says, this is merely to say, and then, I don't I still don't get it. it merely, like, I don't know what he did for fun, but um, he was quite a genius, and we'll, we'll get it at, at this in a moment. By the way, um, I've the way I've understood Marshall McLuhan, and one day I'll remember his name too, is uh, through one of his students, Neil Postman. Now, I've right. read both his, two of his books, um, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is a critique of uh, television news, by and large, and then his book, Technopoly, which is a wonderful description of the of issues created by emerging technologies, and then in my opinion, and I think in his opinion too, a very weak uh, ending about what to do about it. And sure. I don't know if we're going to discover some better ways to what to do about it in our our conversation. But let let's go to that famous quote. A lot of people have heard it before. The medium is the message. Would you like to explain what that means to people? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So again, Marshall McLuhan was trying to say, if I could be concise, because he is not concise. And if you've ever read him, as you just mentioned, Alan, he bounces through metaphors over and over again into all these spheres, and yet it's still quite lively. But to, to boil it down, what he's talking about is that any medium of communication reshapes human behavior, and it reshapes the way in which humans interact with one another. So his his point, and he written a lot about this, so he's actually, his dissertation was on classical studies, the classical trivium, where he went from like Augustine all the way up to Thomas Nash, and he was looking at the pedagogy of the time. And his later work in media is really rooted in some of the observations he makes there. And he wrote things like Gutenberg Galaxy, where he evaluates the printing press and the way it reshaped its culture. All of these media for him have the same effect. Can, yeah. we stop, can, we, can I stop you there for a second? Because it, it's important. So, you know, everything from the creation of fire to later on, or the wheel, mechanical clock um, and then the printing press and there's so many things in between can you give an example of with some of those early inventions how the medium is the message absolutely sure so right to bring it to a point for something like the printing press what he talks about is how an oral culture that is used to 
very limited writing across the masses and used to a procedure and habit of human interaction that includes speaking to one another, especially in churches, right? You have Latin mass being given and the masses hear the word. You have stories being told. What the printing press does in McLuhan's mind is reorient the way that we think. In his mind, you become analytical now because you're reading left to right in the Western tradition, right to left um, in the Eastern tradition, and your brain is converting shapes and images into sounds in your mind, into uh, statements, into propositions. And over time, this amplifies the analytical pro procedures of the mind. It produces in the culture an interest in uh, arguments, dialectical arguments, it, and it amplifies people's capacity to to think and reason and develop argumentation in shapes culture. So that's the way that, again, these are his theories. And when we, we bring them up, we always have to test them at, well, did this actually have a strong effect or is this just a weakness here? But for him, the printing press reshaped it in that way. And then when it gets to the electric media, um, we have the reorientation or, or enveloping of the culture in a whole, what he would think of as an auditory experience. So meaning, that electric technology involves you in the life of everybody all at the same time. And that's kind of what we're experiencing in the internet. And that was sort of what he projected would happen when we do this flip away from the book, which is a private experience. It, it produces those analytical developments. Now the internet just plunges everybody into each other's business, or as he called it, um, what was it? A global village was one of the titles of his book. Right. So I, I don't know if it's... Uh if he mentions this one, but the invention of the printing, without the invention of the printing press, we would not have had uh, the um, the Protestant Reformation mm -hmm. as well as modern democracy. Right. Because it put information, it democrat, democ democ what's the word? Democratized? It democratized information. It put it in the hands of, of the individual common person. It took it out of the hands of the elite. Right, whether the religious elite, the the political elite, and all of a sudden the average person had in their hands a pamphlet or a book, never really happened before, and so the creation of the new medium actually brings about a messaging to people that didn't exist before. And I remember, again, I'm pretty sure it was in uh, his Understanding Media book was encountering him explaining the telegraph. Mm -hmm. And how it was the telegraph that, so prior to the telegraph, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, I think he says, prior to the telegraph, information can only travel as fast as the fastest train. Right, yeah. Right? And then with the telegraph, it was the first time you had instantaneous information. That's right. Now, we take that for granted, but it really wasn't that long ago it, that it didn't even exist. You couldn't, you, you, um, uh, you didn't know that Babe Ruth hit the home run until they actually used, uh, I don't, that was before radio, I'm pretty sure, mm -hmm. they used telegraph and they would have people in, in town squares putting up scores for people to see as the, as the game was going on and they were getting telegraph information. And so once you have those kinds of tools, it changes everything. Absolutely. Now, so the question is, is our current technology, the smartphone um, and, and, and social media and those things, is that just more of the same of what we had or is it something of a different kind? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's categorically different than some of his conversation about the speed of light. You know, when you amplify a sign and it's got the neon lights, that's sort of what he had in mind. That's a, a medium the message is actually written out in light, but we we misunderstand it if we don't understand that the medium of light itself is reshaping how our culture now experiences life together. So, well, that did, again before the neon sign did. I guess I forgot that part of the book. Um, yeah. There's the sign, there's the marquee, but you wouldn't see it from far, far away. It, it would be invisible to you. And now with with the neon lights, it's shooting the message closer to the person. Go on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, if you watch McLuhan, you can look him up on YouTube and he'll be sitting in a chair in black and white spinning around and talking to people or 
in these conversations, it's always really fascinating because... Did he ever talk to uh, um, Alka Mugrich? I, I think so. There might be an interview. I think he did. Uh, well, I'll that's going to mess me up. Maybe something. I better not watch it. You can continue. Maybe you shouldn't. But, <laughs> but go and look him up at another time because it's really interesting to see the way he talks about these things and how it hasn't quite landed in either the audience members or the per the interlocutor that he's speaking with. That That is to say, they're still talking as if the world is sort of in their control and these things are maybe good or bad, but we're not sure. And it, it doesn't really affect me. And and, and uh, McLuhan is over here saying, no, this has transformed our whole experience. So, but to get back to your question, I think in his view, this envelope that is put around our world, as it were, the digital landscape that we call it digital, he would have called it electrical, electric technology. I think it really is just a heightened or amplified version of the kind of theoretical stuff he was dealing with, meaning I don't think it's necessarily a categorical change. But what I will say is the, the important shift or amplification is the presence of the smartphone in your hand. And what I mean by that is we can have public technology, computers, iPads that everyone can see, but the change to the private life of the phone with its privatized um, mediated experience, ads that are for you, your own YouTube experience that you get when you go to that site, your feed. That's a very fascinating word you used earlier, right? Our RSS feeds. What is a feed? A feed is a thing that you it's eat. It's like a trough. We're, are we pigs, right? All of this privatized element is now infused in the enveloping theory that he was talking about. So what happens when we put together what used to be the private experience of a book and the analytical side of that, but it is now sandwiched together with this whole in everyone's business at all time kind of experience that McLuhan was talking about. I was muted. I don't actually like reading eBooks, but there is a service that I use, um, and I could share a link again because I get a free month if people sign up, and it's called Scribd. It's like a, the Netflix of eBooks and audiobooks. It has magazines as well. It's it's very handy. So for about ten dollars US a month, you have access to millions of resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I don't I don't really like you know I don't really like reading like like this. Uh, it's handy, uh, very handy, convenient. Um, I like to hold a book. I like to hold a book, but I, you know, but you know, I'm holding my book, and there's a word I don't understand, and I keep touching it, and the dictionary definition doesn't come up. So exactly. I, I think I think it's out of batteries or something. Um, so it, one of the things, especially on the type of book I might be reading, if it's going to be something more technical, that inbuilt dictionary uh, mm. is really, really wonderful, but. The question is, am I, am I doing any kind of other damage to myself because of the convenience? Right. It's a really fascinating problem. Think about, in McLuhan's words, the extension of ourselves, our nervous system is what he talked about, into the world. And I think it's no more present than in the kind of thing you describe. Calculators. What does a calculator do to a kid's capacity to do math? That's an earlier version of the same problem. Dictionaries. What about YouTube searches or just Google in general or the new up and coming chat GPT, that realm of what we call AI? All of these are the same kind of transformation of my capacity up into the technology, giving over to it some tool or experience I have in order to get a convenience. And it, make, it makes all kinds of problems apparent. If you don't know the definition of something, how do you know when you go to the dictionary, the gateway for the explanation? Well, Google will just tell me the, de you know, the definition. Of course, this is where it comes from. Are you sure? You know, Most of our learning in the book world comes from the context in which we experience a word. This is true for adjectives, adverbs. It's true for verbs. It's true for nouns. The whole panoply of grammar comes to us in a context but it's divorced now or you get something else that's a very low grade problem it's not a big deal right calculators are fine except with ai soon the the uh the connected dictionary to whatever my 
whatever I'm reading or studying, it will know the context. Right. It'll, it's going to know a lot about me. It's going to know about the author. It's going to know about the book. And it's, it'll give me all sorts of information that it would have maybe taken hours to research. And it's going to just feed it to me. There's that word again, automatically. And mm -hmm. the, the question is going to keep coming around again. What is the price we're paying for that level of convenience? Because I, I still think that's certainly that's helpful. But what am I losing? What am I losing? Do we yeah, know yet? Great. We don't quite know yet. But what's interesting is the difference between a person who's been formed in that experience and a person who comes to it later, meaning an older generation who has been trained on books can use Google in a different way and ChatGPT or whatever you want to say, because they're coming from a different formation. But if my kids grow up and their research is through YouTube or through Google, their research is by putting questions into ChatGPT, how does that change their own capacity without those tools to think, to develop their own questions, to read, like actually read a book and find what the argument is? You know, we just have books, like you were saying before, and Kindle or whatever, and you can find, you know, find the passage you want just by searching. You search a keyword. This is transformative. It doesn't really have as much to do with the digital landscape as the technological, like the electronic one, but it's the same principle of if I grow up learning how to read by pressing the search button, more or less, and, and focusing in on whatever text I was supposed to get, what happens to the experience of reading a book? You know, you have the ones for fun, but what if but for work where you're trying to find the argument? It drastically transforms your experience of people's arguments. You're just looking for, you know, your clickbait item. You're curating for yourself. All of these tools really transform the person if it's a formative experience. So the next generation, really. In this kind of context, I, I've thought about, and I may have addressed this, uh, I have a, a podcast that I did on my own uh, what about AI? It's called something like that. Um, and I think it's there where I talk about how uh, the change in in work in much of the world uh, where we become more sedentary because less, less people are farmers. Yeah. A lot of people are sitting at desks all day long. We recognize what's that, what that's done to our bodies. And so then we end up with uh, mitigating that through exercise. Mm -hmm. Farmers didn't have to exercise. Um, depending on if, if your life was full of all sorts of different activities, I imagine they didn't get up and do stretches before they did other things. They, they did their stretches when they bent down and they did this. And it, was, it wasn't the, re, the, the later repetitive tasks of the assembly line um, mm -hmm. that would cause you know, carpal tunnel syndrome and, 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 and that sort of thing. And so it seems to me with the technology, what's happening is there's a mind laziness, a mind sedentariness that's that's becoming part of and hopefully we're going to realize that while we've got these wonderful conveniences that our minds are getting lazy and we do need to find ways to exercise them i don't know yeah. if if doing wordle every day is sufficient or maybe you have to do wordle and sugo how do you say that sugo ah, yeah, thank you that i don't okay. obviously i don't do it uh but uh and, you know, people do cross, crossword puzzles and, and these things to keep their minds active. I don't know if all that is sufficient. Um, and it, I am concerned that there will be intellectual elites that are going to run circles around people who have been really dumbed down because they have gotten so lazy. Now, you know, there are the people that are reading serious books on some sort of e-reader, uh, maybe they're using the dictionary, like like I said, just by touching the word, not going to the dictionary on the shelf. Um, but I remember when our parents, and I'm older than you, so my parents were concerned about how much TV I watched. Mm -hmm. And I know about the damage that, you know, Beverly Hillbillies and Gilligan's Island and, and so on did to me. Um and comic books and that sort of thing, and that I was not developing my mind, how much more now in our binge culture, mm -hmm. which on one hand is not really our topic, but it is because without where we're at in technology with, with broadband internet and 5G, where everything is so easily accessed, 
you know, the first video we downloaded on our on our PC years ago was was a 30 second clip of the Lion King. It was it was is but an inch square, and it took an hour to download. Yeah. And now, of course, you stream instantly, and um, your favorite show gets dumped onto Disney Plus or Netflix all at once very often and you could watch 24 episodes you know and do nothing but yeah what is that doing to our minds what's that doing to our lives what's this doing to our relationships another good question the interesting thing just to pull back a little bit is the promise of technology is always some version of it will free you up to do what you want to do but now we're in a time where People don't know what they want to do, right? That in a way, ambition, ambition goes away. There's a paralysis in the lives of the minds of this generation. Not everybody. Okay, you know what? I, let me stop you there because we probably should be wrapping up. But I would love to know the big why. So something like ambition. Mm -hmm. you're, so from your observation of, of young people, you're seeing a lack of ambition despite access to so much information opportunity all the rest what what has do you know what's caused that well, well yeah like it's just this idea that you can you can get the dopamine or the trigger by playing your video games or doing tiktok videos or you have this habit over time of scrolling and you don't go beyond that remember c.s lewis had that one really potent image of the kid in the sandbox and the parents come and say, hey, let us let me show you the beach. Come, well, I'll, it'll be amazing. And the kid's like, no, I, I, I love the sandbox. Why would I ever leave this? How could there be a better world beyond this? That's something of the experience of the next generation. Except we have the ability to, sh to take that child at the sandbox and show him the beach. Now, we're, my, I, I have a lot of brokenness and issues in my in my background and I've people who you know follow me are aware of, of some of those things but you show me the opportunity and I want the opportunity let's go there let's do that you know I um, I grew up uh, my handwriting is terrible and I use the excuse that I'm left-handed I can't draw a straight line and with the computer I'm writing I'm doing graphic design, things that I don't know, and maybe I have the ability to do it and I just didn't work hard enough, I don't know. I believe I'm significantly challenged in those areas and the computer's given me access to all sorts of things that I could now do and I wanna go do them. And another idea and another idea and, and putting things together that I never put together before, but you're saying young people are lacking ambition. They, it sounds like you're saying the ch not only is the child satisfied the sandbox showing them the video of the beach that in and of itself becomes the 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 goal why do i need to go to the beach if i could watch it on my smartphone i shouldn't be laughing no a hundred percent and look you can go to youtube and watch almost any crazy thing it doesn't mean nobody's ambitious it means that we are creating a larger culture where ambition is lacking because everyone's done it. You can just watch in real time somebody else do this experience. Um, and the, the capacity is stressful. It creates anxiety. It creates difficulty. Like the what do you mean by capacity? When you like say capacity? The capacity to enjoy, say, going to the beach and surfing or skydiving or the capacity to play a guitar and learn that skill, the capacity to achieve and do things that are difficult that will enable you to have a, an enjoyment, to, to learn how to do art. All of these things require of us a kind of pressure and intellectually it's the same way. Why would I learn? Why would I learn about quantum physics? Like really learn it and, and get into it. And people are curious about it. But why go to the trouble of that difficulty of the mind? It just creates more anxiety. I can just watch somebody have fun. I can just binge watch this Netflix series. I can get my dopamine hit on my my social media. These are the challenges that the digital do, age really- Do you think some of that is due to the more and more realistic images that we're seeing? 
I remember when I first heard about HD, I thought, oh, that's silly. My 640 by 480, you know, a color TV, that's fine. It's it's nice, you know, a hockey game in color. We I grew up with black and white TV and seeing color, wow. And then seeing it in HD. Sure. And and it I wonder if it's some of that is it's be, it becomes immersive in a way that it wasn't before. And I yeah. and what you're saying, Todd, is is it, it's really something. If it's if the technologies ha actually hit this sweet spot, but it may not be that sweet, of drawing you into the experience sufficiently enough to comp like. So when you weigh what you're calling like the anxiety of going to the beach or the anxiety of learning the guitar, that there's something about the virtual experience that's good in that that's enough to give you sufficient pleasure to not want to go for the real thing. That's pretty heavy duty. And I don't know if you saw the the release of the the first um, the the Apple's new VR glasses. Right. Yes. Like and you know. I want to say you know, enough already, like we don't need more realistic virtual whatever, and it's taking things even further, and it's like, and I know I'm sure there's a, some sci-fi movie like this where you get into this and you never get out. That's right. So it sounds like that's, so this is actually very serious, and especially when you think there's malevolent forces out there that want to manipulate people, whether it's for business or political gain, and you've got the people getting more and more disengaged and dumbed down, and this is the the generation how they're being trained. Don't you think we need to do something about it? I I think we do, and I think I think we are doing something about it. The thing I come back to, just I know we're kind of out of time, but I'm definitely enjoying this conversation. Is Christ is Lord, and I really believe that, meaning. There, this is an age that has full of anxiety. And these people are there, they express their anxiety in all sorts of ways in these social media. It's all bare and open for us to see their anxiety about major political issues. You think of major ideological issues, identity issues, all of these things are top of mind right now and on people's lips as they speak. All of it really amplified by the digital age. I'm not, um, but Christ is Lord. And what I mean is this will pass away too. Just like when the printing press came out and it had a shocking transformation over those hundred years, a little slower than the internet, but you, you know, it did something to culture that was irrevocable as you were, you were talking about democracy and these sorts of pieces. This will have a shaping effect, but I don't think Christians need to be worried. And what I mean by that is, uh, it is, it is something we can engage with because People are so aware of these problems. They are so anxious. Who are they going to speak to? Christians don't have to do much. You know, you don't have to leverage this amazing apologetic moment and go through um, all of the defenses of the Christian faith just to get through to somebody. It's often as simple as just talking to them and showing that there is a real life that they can experience. That kind of gripping moment in a personal relationship where you're not just either talking about the weather, talking about your drinking buddies, talking about what you're doing with your money on a weekend, but giving sort of the living word of life. That seems to me to be available to every Christian and cuts through a lot of this digital noise um, that so consumes people. I, it's not like a magic bullet solution, but for me, uh, Christians, there's so, so many advantages not the technological ones we usually think of, meaning we can put sermons out there. We can put amazing Christian literature. We can do Christian movies. That's what we should do. No, no, all of that stuff is not really going to address the medium is the message problem. The, the truth is, is having a approach to relationship that values getting into that person's life. Maybe you tell them, look, are you addicted to the phone? Like, let's talk about this. Let's talk about your anxieties and where they come from and show how Christianity is a rich resource for, for meeting those needs. You know, these kinds of conversations are the sort of thing that we see. And, um, you know, we think about my neighbor, even I know we're going past time here, but my wife was talking to our next door neighbor and seeing in her all of these similar anxieties and able just to speak the truth of Christ in a simple way. And that enables that relationship to continue so that this lady knows, wow, there's somebody real here next door 
You know what I mean? These are the sorts of anecdotes that I think are useful for people to focus on. We don't have to have a world dominating, uh, you know, sectarian approach of build our own Christian kingdom and let's get us videos and we'll get our speakers and we'll get the pizzazz. I don't think that's the answer for Christianity, but it's maybe the beginning of one. Yeah, I want to hold on to this before, and I'm not too worried about the time. If the people don't want to watch, they could have turned us off a long time ago. Uh, sure. But uh, thus is the technology. Um, and we're not preempting your show because you could just go watch whatever you want right now. But please come back. Come back later. Um, the great. whole anxiety thing, uh, I was fascinated by what happened uh, with the recent uh, the smoke issue that we faced here in Ottawa. And yeah. uh, if the if the pictures are correct, it looked like uh, the northeastern United States got it worse than we had. Um, here it was, it looked cloudy, but it wasn't cloudy. You could smell like campfire, and some people described it a little bit worse. But it was interesting to me to see how people reacted because we're the post-COVID generation, and there was yeah. like this COVID-esque reaction to this doom and gloom message. And and I, I read the Environment Canada, which those of you outside of Canada likes, that's our main weather uh, government agency. And, um, and uh, the advisory that they gave was very clear. If you had a, a certain conditions, you need to be very careful, probably stay indoors, don't do heavy exertion. If it starts to bother you, stop. But there was no stay at home advisory for the general population. But my impression was all these people were wearing masks, many of which did nothing to stop the particulates, as they're called, from entering their lungs. And, um, or they just weren't there. People were just, they weren't outside because they had gotten scared. And we've, and so this anxiety thing, you know, COVID, the COVID response that we had could not have happened without the digitized world. If we didn't have Zoom and we didn't have these other things, and I appreciate I'm using it right now to record this and talk to you, um, but because we have this virtual experience, that was one of the reasons why we were less prone to try, to, many of us to try to get together and to push through whether it's the fear of sickness, the fear of death, which human beings have been living with from the beginning and have navigated threats, but now we don't have to navigate threats. We, we, we just stay at home and we, we engage digitally. And, and this is, it's, it's challenging me to focus on the anxiety factor that actually it looks like the digitized world has increased the anxiety as opposed to um, help us overcome it. So that's really, an, I think, a really important takeaway from our time. Yeah, and it's predictable, meaning if you give over yourself to the Internet, if all of your duties and work and, and your love life and your relationships are all linked in, then it's, if that gets taken away... Was that an ad for be... LinkedIn? Sorry. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Then this anxiety is going to be amplified whenever those things go off or whenever you lose your tech or when there's a distribution of information top down from a government. These, these pieces are all so intimately linked. Uh, and that's probably what's really fascinating is our whole human interface now is linked into these pieces. So anytime there's a disruption on this part, say my love life, there's also potentially an interruption in my workplace. And, you see this blending of the experience across people's smartphone use really amplifies anxiety in these pieces. It also makes for authority challenges, meaning when you think about how you can distribute to people what to believe and what to think, it often comes down to this problem of where are you getting your information from? You know, what counts as authority? Why should you believe it? And we sort of, get, again, give over the whole apparatus of how we think of authority into these spaces. And again, it's not that the government of Canada is horrible or evil or something. It's just that the whole mechanism itself lends itself to this strange interaction of authority through tech and the digital age. Yeah, we've never had so many people in our house before. And some of them can wield some pretty big swords, too. That, that, sure. That's something that, you know, TV did do that a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But not not the way the the internet does, and uh, I, th I think there's a lot to to continue to th to think about. Um, you know, you mentioned you know 
I think I heard you correctly, that we understand that this too will pass away, but there's also a way in the wilderness that uh, I believe that, uh, that God and through his word were given that we can navigate a digital world. Um, if, you know, and I'm open, maybe I'll, you know, I'd like to have somebody on who will talk about disconnecting from that. Is, is it really possible? You know, how's it working for you? That, that sort of thing. Cause I, I, I don't think that's necessarily bad, but I do think many of us are called to, um, to, uh, engage it and the people that are the, on that are on it. I don't think we're all going to go to the country and live on farms. I don't think that's the solution, but I'm open to hear from people who have that kind of argument. So Todd, thank you so much for doing uh, this with me today. If people want to contact you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, you can um, get me at toddanderson90 at gmail.com. And I'm happy to chat about any of these issues or to help people think through. Just as a last note, I think we ought not to be anxious ourselves. You know, the main thing I tell people practically is think about your own private use of tech. Make sure that you're speaking with others about it. That's the primary piece is when our consciousness goes away from it, we run into problems, but don't be afraid. And within the Christian community, that's a, a huge foundation for speaking to those who are outside that there's not a fear or anxiety, but thanks so much for having me on, Alan. I feel we could have gone for another two hours. So I appreciate <laughs> your your time and taking the time to chat with me about these issues. And maybe we'll do this again. But before I let you go, I um, and if people want to know more about Augustine College, what should they do? Yeah, you can go to augustinecollege.org. And we do an eight-month program, as you were mentioning, Alan. We also run a number of conferences that are related. And the goal is to do sort of classical Christian thinking, how to get students in, challenge them intellectually, with a faith-based uh, program. So you can go to the website and find more about that and, and also contact me as well. Yeah, and I'll put the links both to your email and to Augustine College's website in the description. So again, thank you so much. Okay, so as Todd said, if you want to contact him, you could do so by email, by uh, his name, Todd Anderson 9090, Todd Anderson 90 at gmail.com. Um, and I'll put uh, the website for Augustine College in the description along with Todd's uh, email address. If you want to contact me, you could do that at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. Special thanks to people who've already subscribed to my YouTube channel. If you haven't yet done that, please do so, as well as like and share and all those good things. So until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Thinking Biblically.